Let me welcome you very warmly to Grace Church of Greenwich, especially if this is your first time with us. We are in the middle of a series in John chapter 20, and we're glad you could join us uh, for that. But let me pray as we begin. Father, help me to teach only what you would say. Help me to be faithful to your word. Please speak to us by your spirit. And please give us ears to hear. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What is Jesus doing now? 2,000 years ago, that would have been an easy question to answer. He was stomping around Galilee and Judea, declaring war on sickness and evil and death. And if you were there, you could have seen it with your own eyes. You could have watched Jesus heal the sick and feed the hungry and raise people from the dead. You could also have heard him speak. He was able to turn a life around with a single conversation. And he could silence his enemies with the word. Pretty much every time Jesus spoke, it ended with a mic drop. But that was 2,000 years ago. So what is Jesus doing now? If we don't have a clear answer to that question, we may think he's doing nothing. How many times have we prayed to God and it seemed like the only answer we got was silence? Is Jesus really there? Is he listening? And does he do anything for his people? And if you're here looking into Christianity, this may be one of the reasons you're a skeptic. It doesn't look like Jesus is here. And if he is out there somewhere, then why doesn't he make himself clearer? Our text today is designed to answer that question, what is Jesus doing now? And our key verse is verse 21. So have a look with me there. And Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And that's the answer to our question. The one who was sent by the Father is now sending his people. That's what he's doing today. And notice that what he's doing today is closely linked to what he did 2,000 years ago. As the Father has sent me. That's Jesus 2,000 years ago declaring war on sin and evil and death. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So according to Jesus, all the excitement of the Gospels is not limited to the Gospels. And that may be hard to believe, but that's what Jesus says here. He is still at work today. He is doing the same kind of work, and he is doing it through his people. So if you want to see Jesus at work, Jesus would say, look at the people I am sending. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And he is sending his people into the world for the very same purpose that his father sent him to the world. So let's start by looking at the one who was sent by the father, and that's point one on your outlines. Now it's worth saying this text is a little weird, especially for our secular minds. Uh, there are things happening here that we simply don't understand. So for example, have a look with me at verse 19. On the evening of that day, that is Easter Sunday, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. So the risen Jesus, who has a physical body, is somehow able to appear in a locked room. And I don't think he went through the door. This is weird. It breaks all the laws of physics. It defies normal human experience. And, and the secular mind, that is the modern Western mind, it's very dismissive of things that don't fit in our box. And this is one of them. A man coming back from the dead is bad enough, but now he is walking through walls. And there are one of two ways you can respond to something like this. Either you dismiss it because it doesn't fit in your box, or maybe you admit that your box is too small. And we do this all the time whenever we come across new evidence. Um, either we adjust the size of our box or we refuse to believe what we're seeing. And one of those approaches is rational and the other is closed-minded. 
Jesus wants us to consider the evidence. Uh, sorry, John. Uh, Jesus was laid in the tomb, and the same tomb was empty 36 hours later. And the disciples are hiding in a locked room, locks that were designed to keep people out. Literally, they're hiding in a box. But here's Jesus making a mockery of their box. These are the facts that John wants us to consider. And it seems strange to dismiss them just because they don't fit in our box. Jesus consistently exposes the limits of our understanding. He defies normal human experience. And he has a perfectly logical explanation for all of it. He is not of this world. His father sent him into this world. And that means he came from outside. There's something out there beyond the universe we see, beyond the limits of human understanding. There's a power that is above us. And Jesus came to show us what that is. Now, according to the secular mind, if we cannot see it or understand it, then it doesn't exist. This world is limited to what we can see and comprehend. Man is the measure of all things. But I hope you can see that's a closed-minded way of looking at the world. How many times have human beings been wrong about what is possible? In the last 100 years alone, uh, people thought cars were a fad, that TVs would fail, that the iPhone would flop, and that remote shopping would never work. We'll tell that to Jeff Bezos, the second richest man in the world. Well, I think he dropped the third on Friday, but the point holds. Are we willing to admit that there are things we don't understand, things that define normal human experience, things we cannot explain unless they're explained to us? By the way, it's a good thing that our world is not limited to a box, to the secular way of thinking. If you're a refugee in Ukraine and you've lost your husband or your father or your son to the war, the last thing you want to hear is that we are limited to a box, that we're born in a box, that we live in a box, and then we die in a box. And there's nothing outside that box. That's a secular way of thinking. But that is not what Jesus says here. If you ever find yourself at the end of your rope, if you ever find that your hands are not big enough, or your arms are not long enough, or your mind is not sharp enough to find a solution to your problem, well, Jesus is saying, why don't you let me handle it? I am not bound by your limits. And if he can come back from the dead, and walk through solid walls, it raises the question, what else can he do? Is there any limit to his power? Jesus wants us to know that there is someone who can help, someone who can shatter the limits of human possibility. Here the disciples are hiding in a locked room, a box they built for themselves. And Jesus came and stood among them. And Jesus has something to say to them. Uh, twice in our text, he says, peace be with you. So this higher power, this transcendent being, the one who makes a mockery of the box we've put around our world, he comes offering peace. He wants an end to the war. Now here in John 20, we're jumping into the middle of a very long story. And in one sense, it's a story of war and peace. And I'm afraid we don't come out looking very good in this story. Now, for the first time in a generation, we're on the brink of war, and it's nice to be on the right side for once. But one thing people don't realize is that we have always been at war with God, and we're the ones who started it. We're the aggressors in this war. We have trampled on God's rightful authority, on his sovereign territory, so to speak, and we have harmed the people he has made. Every time we hurt someone or use someone, or ignore someone in pain. We're doing violence to the image of God, to the people made in his image. Maybe we're not as bad as soldiers who shoot civilians, but we're not as far up as we'd like to think. We are the aggressors in this war. And to make matters worse, we are also laughably outmatched. 
We have declared war on the one who makes a mockery of human limitations, and he has every right to demand justice and press charges and try us as war criminals in his heavenly courts. And if we ever manage to get our hands on President Putin, our next challenge will be keeping him alive long enough to give him a fair trial. But there's nothing that can keep us out of the hands of the living God. And the trials in his court are only ever fair. But that's precisely the problem. The last thing we want is a fair trial before the judge of all the earth. We all have something called a conscience. It's that annoying voice in your head that says, well, you know what you're doing is wrong, but you're doing it anyway. And I tend to ignore that voice when I'm playing Uno with my kids and looking at their cards. Um, but in my defense, uh, it's their fault for playing an open hand. But that accusing voice is harder to ignore when it's something serious, when there's more at stake than just a game of cards. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that I yelled at my kids for nothing. I'm sure, I'm sure I'm the only parent who's ever done such a thing, but my conscience troubled me. It accused me because I knew I'd done something wrong. Now that trial by conscience, it's a dress rehearsal for another trial. And it's the trial we face at the end of our lives when we stand before God as our judge. Now in this life, um, it's easy to get yourself off the hook. When your conscience is your only accuser, it's easy to come out of that trial looking like a good person because the only person you need to convince is you. And we'll say things like, but I'm just doing the best I can, or at least I'm not as bad as them, or you can't expect me to be perfect. And those arguments, those excuses, they will sound convincing when you are the only person who needs to be convinced. But God is not so easily convinced. We want to grade ourselves on a curve, uh, but above average doesn't cut it with God because his standard is perfection. And when we're standing before God as our judge, uh, then we'll see how pathetic our excuses really are. The last thing we want is a fair trial before the judge of all the earth. But Jesus says, there is another way. And instead of pressing charges, look at what he says instead. Verse 19, verse 21, he says, peace. Peace be with you. He wants an end to this war, the war that we started, and he offers terms of peace. Now, this is especially surprising when you think about the people in that room. These disciples hiding in the locked room, they haven't exactly covered themselves in glory. Um, over the last three days alone, they have doubted Jesus and deserted him and denied him. So maybe you're expecting a different kind of reunion. Maybe Jesus is coming back to rebuke them or disown them. I mean, isn't that our natural instinct to get even, to hit back? But Jesus comes back from the dead and tracks down his worthless followers to do what? To say peace. It's the first thing he says to them. Peace be with you. And this is a peace he bought with his blood. And the way he did it is this. He said to his father, you should treat me like a criminal and you should treat them like a son. Let me swap places with them. My life for theirs. I think that's a fair trade. So do we have a deal? And both the father and the son thought this was a very good idea. So a deal was struck. Jesus would die the death that we deserve so that those who believe in him could enjoy the life that he earned. Jesus bought this peace with his blood. And the one who should be against us is for us. He shattered the limits of what is humanly possible by saving people like us. And he says, peace be with you. And that brings us to our key verse, verse 21. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So Jesus sends his people into the world for the very same purpose that his Father sent him to the world. 
we have the same mission as Jesus. So, of course, we need to ask, what is the mission? For what purpose did God send Jesus? Now, it's worth saying uh, that word mission, it can be stretched to mean just about anything. Uh, everyone likes to claim they're on mission. It makes whatever you're doing sound important. Um, it authorizes your work as the very work of God. It gives instant legitimacy to any church program. Just call it mission and you've claimed the moral high ground. But what would Jesus say the mission is? Well, according to him, his mission is peace. And he bought that peace with his blood. And now he sends us to offer that peace to the world. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And then verse 22, he promises to give us the Holy Spirit. When Jesus breathes on the disciples, he's anticipating the day of Pentecost. He's looking forward to the day when he pours out his spirit on the people. It's almost an acted parable as he looks forward to Pentecost. And then verse 23, he empowers us by his spirit to speak with his authority, to speak the very words of Jesus. And that's clear from the rest of John's gospel. The spirit Jesus sends is the spirit of truth. And he speaks with Jesus's authority and he empowers us to speak the words of Jesus. And that's how we offer peace to the world. We speak the words of Jesus. We offer his terms of peace because we are sent by the one who bought that peace with his blood. Now, this, by the way, is the reason we insist on teaching the Bible here at Grace Church. It's not because we're academic or intellectual or out of touch with the times. It's because we believe what Jesus says. There in chapter 6, and it's printed in your outlines. But Jesus says, it is the Spirit who gives life. And the words of Jesus are Spirit and life. If you come to Grace Church, I'm afraid we don't have a lot to offer you. We don't have a lot of programs. We don't even have a building. And if you want to um, meet a bunch of people who keep messing up, come to church, or at least come to Grace Church. I won't speak for other churches, but come to Grace Church and you will see that we fail a lot. But you will also see that we are forgiven because we have peace with God. That, by the way, is the only difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. We have accepted his terms of peace. And if you come to Grace Church, the one thing we will do every single week is teach you the Bible. Because wherever the Bible is taught carefully, the voice of Jesus is heard clearly. And we think this is the most kind and loving and life-giving thing we can do for the people around us. Because the words of Jesus are the words of life. And we will aim to be so faithful to the words of Jesus that when people hear us speak, they will hear the very words of Christ. And please hold us accountable to that. Please check your Bibles and see if we are speaking the words of Jesus. Because it's his words that are spirits in life. And verse 23 tells us that when we speak the words of Jesus, we speak with his authority. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And that's a remarkable thing to say. I mean, how is this even possible? How could mere human beings forgive the sins of others or withhold forgiveness from them? Well, Jesus says, if we are teaching his words, then we are making his promises and giving his warnings. So every time we open the Bible and teach people what it says, we are speaking with the authority of Jesus Christ himself. And in the name of Jesus, we are promising forgiveness to those who believe. And we are also warning of judgment to those who will not. And what we are promising and warning will in fact come to pass. 
Every time we open the Bible, we are saying to those who believe that they have peace with God and life in the name of Jesus. And we are also saying to those who don't believe that they will fail God's standards and be condemned forever. And those are terrible things to say if they are not in fact true. So are we speaking the truth? Do we have any authority to say such things? Well, if we are teaching the words of Jesus, then the answer is yes. And we may in fact say to those who believe, your sins are forgiven. And that's his promise, not mine. And we have to say to those who won't believe, your sins remain on you and you will get a fair trial. And one day everyone will know that we are speaking the truth. Verse 23 is true, so long as we are speaking the words of Jesus, and it's with his authority that we offer forgiveness and withhold it. So as we close, what is Jesus doing now? Well, he is sending his people into the world to offer peace and forgiveness in his name. That's the reason he came in the first place, and he continues his work through us. And can I just say to those who believe and those who do not, nothing matters more than this. And there are lots of things in life that matter, your job, your relationships, your family. These are all very important things. But nothing matters more than this. Do you have peace with God? Have you accepted his terms of peace? Have you believed in Jesus and received forgiveness in his name? And if you have, if you're a Christian, then you already have the thing that matters most. You are rich. Maybe you don't have a penny to your name, but you're still rich because you have peace with God. So what does this mean on Monday morning when you walk into school? Or show up to work. Well, whatever happens to you that day, you've already won. You've got the best thing in the world. You have peace with God. Now, don't get proud about it. You didn't earn it or deserve it. Jesus gave it to you as a gift. He bought it for you with his blood. But you still have it. And no matter what happens to you, you can't lose it. You're untouchable. You're made of Teflon or titanium. At the end of the day, there's nothing they can do to you that will stick. They could fire you and you would still be rich because you have peace with God. And you also get to represent the king. You're an ambassador for his kingdom. Wherever you go, you're on mission. Jesus has sent you to offer his terms of peace. So be kind, be godly, be a Christian, and be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. And pray. Pray that the Lord will open a door so that you can share his words of life. Wherever you go, you're on mission. And that means you have a purpose. You have something to live for. And if it ever comes to it, something to die for. Because Jesus has sent you to offer his terms of peace. One day we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. And there are no secrets on that day. All your thoughts and words and actions will be written down in a book. And one of two things will happen. Either God will close the book and welcome you into his presence, or the book will stay open and you will get a fair trial. And on that day, all of us will see that nothing matters more than this. Have you been forgiven? Do you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ? As the Father has sent me, even so, I am sending you. Jesus came so that our sins might be forgiven. And here we are now, 
offering forgiveness in his name. Let me close in a short prayer. Father, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus into this world, not to condemn it, but to save it. Thank you that he died the death that we deserve so that we might live the life that he earned. Thank you that he has now sent us into the world to offer life and forgiveness in his name. We pray that you would draw people to yourself, that we would be faithful to his words, and that his sheep would hear his voice. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.